question. All participants, please use the chat box to deliver the questions. Thank you for your cooperation and consideration. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the guest lecture series on Sustainable Development Goals today, Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. I am Diaz from ITS Global Engagement, and I will be your master of ceremony this afternoon. And thank you for joining our guest lecture series on SDGs today. Um, the core topic of, of today's series represents the 13th of GLS goal, namely climate action. And before we start our agenda, let me inform you of some rules during the event. First, please adjust your name or ID screen using format, name underscore campus. And second, during the lecture, please turn your microphone off during the session and only turn it on when moderator gives the chance. And third, please fill your attendance form at the link given in the chat box, uh, which be given by our committee. And for participants who wish to get an e-certificate and stamp, please fill the attendance uh, 15 minutes after the session starts. And next, Participants who wish to get, um, sorry, participants who wish to ask questions during the question and answer session, please send your questions to bit.ly slash GLS underscore QA, which will also be shared by our mother, by our committee. And the link for question listed in the chat room as well. Or you can ask directly by clicking the right hand feature. And today's GLS on SDGs will present a topic entitled e Asia Project on Biomass Potential and Utilization that will be delivered by Professor Armando Kikuitai from Kumamoto University. And also a topic entitled Mitigating Climate Change by CO2 Capture and Utilization delivered by Dr. Lee Pengteh from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. And this lecture will be moderated by Bu Ainul Firdhatun Nisa, Master of Science from ITS. Before we start our agenda, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follow. The first stage is opening, and the second, there will be an introduction to the moderator and speaker. And third, we continue to the lecture session, and next, there will be a Q&A session, and it will be followed by certificate awarding. And we will come to a closing. And also now, before we proceed to the next agenda, let me introduce our moderator. Good afternoon, Bu Ainul. Good afternoon, Batias. Nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you too, Bu Ainul. Bu Ainul. Master of Science, was graduated from ITS, majoring in Environmental Engineering as Bachelor of Engineering. Then she acquired Master of Science from University of Stuttgart. And currently, she is the junior lecturer at Department of Environmental Engineering of ITS. She is the professional member as well of International Association for Hydro Environment Engineering and Research, or IEHR, and Sustainable Sanitation Alliance, and Rural Water Supply Network as well. And now, without further ado, let's proceed to the main agenda for Ibu Ainul Firdatun. Nista, and the time is yours. Uh, thank you very much for um, Batias for a nice introduction. I would like to um, spend a couple of minutes first to greet 
our uh, great speakers today. So good afternoon again, uh, Professor Armando uh, Kitain, and then uh, Dr. T. Uh, Lipeng from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Also good afternoon for uh, Dr. Maria Anitya Sari. Hello, good afternoon, Mbak Virda. Thank you so much for moderating this session. Hello, Professor Armando, and also hello, hello Dr. Teh Lipeng. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maria. Okay, um, so everyone, um, as explained by Mbak Tias earlier, uh, today we will hear two lectures from our uh, speakers today. The first is Professor Armando uh, Kitain from Kumamoto University. I would like to uh, briefly so uh, today we will hear uh, two lectures. First is Professor Armando Kitain, and then the second is uh, from the Dr. Ati uh, Lepeng from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Uh, so for the first speaker, Professor Armando Kitain from Kumamoto University, we will listen uh, for about 40 minutes, Professor. But before we start, I would like to read out a brief uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, from Professor Armando Kitain. So uh, Professor Armando is currently a full professor at the Ikunmamoto University. So he is uh, a specialist uh, in chemical engineering. So I have already uh, researched some of the, your background. Uh, your research is really uh, interesting, especially for our students uh, who will listen to the lectures today. Um, so Professor Armando research is mainly about biomass and also a biodiesel. So I, I'm personally also looking forward to the lecture today. Um, Professor Arman, Armando awards, um, two of them are education awards from the Kumamoto University last year, yeah, 2020. And the second is a research award uh, from Kumamoto University. Yeah. In addition to the uh, full professor at Kumamoto University, he has been also uh, since 2018, the deputy uh, director of Center for International Education. And he has been a member for the professional association, such as a Society of Chemical Engineers Japan, American Institute of Chemical Engineers, Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers, also Society of Separation Process Engineers. So, uh, without further ado, I will hand uh, this offer to Professor Amana to deliver um, lecture this afternoon. You will have uh, 40 minutes for the session. And then after that, uh, we will listen to um, another lectures by uh, Dr. Uh, Li Pengte. And then after what, in the end, we will have a question and answer session. So for participants, if you have any question, so please, um, write your question in the chat box, or you can also um, submit your question uh, via the uh, form submitted by uh, the committee letter, or you can also use the raise hand feature uh, letter in the Zoom uh, during our uh, question and session, uh, question and answer session. So please, uh, Professor Armando uh, Kitain, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry that I always have difficulty pronouncing your names, but uh, time is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Fridatu, for your very kind introduction. Thank you to ITS. Thank you to the organizer, especially Professor Dr. Maria, for having me here. It's really an honor for me to contribute to this uh, guest lecture series on sustainable development goals, because almost all of my activities, whether it's education or research, is leaning towards the uh, contribution to the attainment of the sustainable development goals. I really thank you for having me here. My talk for today is uh, on uh, our EASA project on biomass potential and utilization, focusing on algal biomass for SDGs, which ITS is also part of the team, headed by Dr. Siti Salaika. So uh, it will be focusing on algal biomass for SDGs. 
Before I uh, introduce our project on uh, algal biomass, let me first introduce in one slide, Kumamoto University. Kumamoto University actually started as a fifth, or I should say the fifth national high school. When you say fifth, so it's one of the five national high schools established by the Japanese government um, in the 19th uh, century. So the first one is Tokyo High School, which is now Tokyo University and uh, so on. And Kumamoto University is the fifth national high school. And uh, we have celebrated writers like uh, Natsume Soseki, used to be a teacher of the fifth national high school. And uh, of course, if you visit Kumamoto, you should also visit Mount Aso. The scenery in Mount Aso is really amazing. You should visit it. We are very close to uh, Hot Springs plenty of hot springs and also if you would like to uh, relax on the beach in summer amakusa is easily accessible from downtown kumamoto and of course we have kumamoto castle the famous from kumamoto castle and around kumamoto castle you can see a lot of trees that's why kumamoto is called forest city and of course, in summer, you should taste the very sweet watermelon. And if you go to Kumamoto University, you will be welcomed by these gorgeous akamon. We call it akamon in Japanese, but it's a red date, actually. All right. Let me start my talk about uh, biomass utilization by mentioning an excerpt of the remarks of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres during the UN Climate Change Conference that just happened in Glasgow about 10 days ago. He mentioned that uh, our addiction to fossil fuels is pushing humanity to the brink. We face a stark choice. Either we stop it or it stops us. We should stop the use of fossil fuels. But what are some of the alternatives? to fossil fuels. We are so lucky because we are in Asia, especially Southeast Asia, because we have this abundant biomass supply. And actually ASEAN has the most abundant biomass potential in the world. You look at this. This part of Southeast Asia, actually, part of Asia has the most abundant biomass potential. And if you look at the figures, well, I hope I'm sharing the right. All right, good. If you look at the figures, there you are. Our biomass energy potential is the highest among all regions of the world, even double the potential that Europe has, or even if you combine the potential, biomass potential of North America and Europe, Asia has even larger potential. When we talk of biomass, what are those uh, biomass resources? 
of course, the first generation biomass uh, feedstock are those of uh, the corn, but this competes with the food supply. And then we have the second generation, the lignocellulosics. When we say lignocellulosic, it consists of lignin and cellulose. You can find these chemicals or materials in trees. This is a chemical structure of lignin and cellulose. And from these chemical or from these uh, feedstocks, you can actually get a lot of possible useful chemicals by breaking those into small pieces, as if we are breaking the crude oil into small pieces to get the gasoline and the diesel fuels that we are currently using nowadays. And the third generation, the algae, algal biomass algae. I am particularly interested in algae. Why? As compared to those uh, productive terrestrial plants, algae is even, or has even higher productivity. You can see here, as compared to soybeans, sesame, jotropha, or even cellulosic ethanol, algae actually has uh, the highest productivity. It exhibits high photosynthetic efficiency and high yields compared to these uh, productive terrestrial plants. And what do you have in algae? For example, microalgae. You have the protein. You have the carbohydrates. You also have the lipids. We can top this feedstocks or chemicals in algae in order to produce useful chemicals and bioenergy. And for this reason, we form a team. We apply for funding. We got it. This is or this project is actually a three-year project. Um, but this is extended up to next year because of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. The title of the project is Development of Algal Bioenergy Systems for Green and Sustainable ASEAN Region in collaboration with these universities from Southeast Asia. And ITS is part of this team. This is multidisciplinary and I should say multinational uh, project collaboration. Multidisciplinary, we actually uh, top various disciplines in chemical engineering in order to convert algae into useful biochemicals and bioenergy. For example, Thailand, Chulalongkorn University focuses on the development of uh, ultrasonic processes, um, development of biofunctional catalysts, and so on. ITS is on algal culture and cultivation also on the utilization of hydrothermal technology and supercritical fluids. The Philippines on LCA analysis, mathematical modeling. Vietnam also contributes to this project uh, by sharing information on how to culture algae in Vietnam. Malaysia on the properties of biofuels and uh, so on. And Japan here, Komomoto University, we apply green technologies. We also develop uh, biofunctional catalysts for this project. Here is the team. So this is the 
kickoff meeting that happened in Thailand to Longkorn University in 2019. So uh, I put here number 17, SDGs number 17, partnership for the goals. And number five, gender equality. We make sure that uh, we have also lady researchers in our team. Development of technologies, this is one of the goal of this project, green and sustainable technologies, focusing on the use of carbon materials, the use of microwave, which is also a green energy because uh, this is electricity based energy, water, carbon dioxide. Let me talk about this green and sustainable technologies. Synergy of microwave carbocatalysis. Let me show to you in this video the advantages of the synergy of microwave and carbocatalysis. Microwave is applied instantaneously in only 0.5 seconds. It's off for 4.5 seconds. And you can see bubbles forming. There is a thermocouple measuring the temperature of the solvent, which is decking. The solvent is decking. And there is, this is a carbon material. Decking, carbon, the thermocouple to measure the temperature. Microwave is irradiated in only 0.5 seconds and it's off for 4.5 seconds. Formation of bubbles indicate that at the surface of carbon, we can reach the boiling point of decane, which is 174 degrees centigrade. However, if you look at the temperature of the decane, it reaches only 70 degrees centigrade after about two minutes. This shows how selective, how internal, because it's only heating the carbon inside the solvent, and how rapid, because it can reach the temperature or the boiling point of decking on the surface of the carbon. It can reach the boiling point of decking, which is 174 degrees centigrade, instantaneously when you apply microwave irradiation. This is the beauty of the synergy of carbon and microwave heating. Talking about carbon, we can utilize the most available carbon that we can think of, the carbon present in pencil. Actually, the lead of the pencil consists of graphite, which can also be produced from natural materials or from biomass, graphite. This is one example of carbon material that we can tap. We can convert graphite into catalysts. We call it graphene oxide by oxidation and by exfoliation. By oxidation, you will get graphite oxide. When you exfoliate it, you get those layers of graphene oxide. And this two-dimensional layer of graphene oxide has many chemical and physical properties that we can utilize in order to catalyze our reactions. These are some of the possible catalytic active sites on the surface of graphene oxide. We have the basic group, which you can use to catalyze um, 
reactions that will require base catalysts. Acidic part, again, you can tap this or you can use this in order to catalyze reactions that will require acidic catalyst and so on. A lot of possibilities for these very versatile catalysts, graphene oxide from graphite. And synergizing it with microwave can, of course, give us even more advantages. It can significantly accelerate any reaction. Remember the video I showed to you. The reactions on, if you use a solid catalyst, the reactions happen on the surface of the catalyst. And the surface of this carbon material will reach a temperature much, much higher than the temperature of the solvent. So we apply this technology, one, on the production of biofuels, bioenergy from waste oil. This is, just an, this is just an example, but you can also apply the technologies using other possible oil feedstocks, like for example, palm oil, coconut oil, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, but we use waste oil because Japan doesn't have much natural oils or plant oils. So we top waste oil. Waste oil consists of free fatty acids and also three glyceride. The free fatty acid will require an acidic catalyst in order for this material to be converted into biodiesel. And the triglyceride will require a base catalyst. Graphene oxide serves as both an acidic catalyst and a basic catalyst in order to convert those chemicals present in waste oil into biodiesel. Now, converting waste oil into biodiesel, we also got glycerol as a byproduct. This will increase the load. In the future, if we convert the plant oils into biodiesel, we'll be getting a lot of glycerol. It will increase also the load, the environmental loading. So instead of just simply disposing the glycerol, we convert glycerol into further useful chemical. We call it glycerol third butyl ether by reacting it with butyl alcohol, third butyl alcohol. And third butyl alcohol can also be derived from biomass by fermentation. So this GTBE has properties that when you add to biodiesel will increase its certain number. What do we mean by certain number? It's like octane enhancer that you add in gasoline. A sports car requires special gasoline that has high octane number in order to avoid knocking, knocking of engine. It's the same with biodiesel or diesel engine. In order to avoid knocking of the diesel engine, you need a very high setting number. And GTBE, if you add it to biodiesel fuel, will increase the setting number of biodiesel. So that's the idea. Instead of discarding glycerol, convert it instead to GTBE. Once you produce GTBE, you can add it to biodiesel and you will get biodiesel with higher certain number. If you are interested in the reaction mechanism on the geo surface, you may want to refer to our uh, published article in uh, ACS Energy and Fuels. We also develop 
this kind of catalyst in combination with a bentonite, this is a clay, right? Naturally available in combination with graphene oxide. Again, for esterification and transesterification, we get a higher efficiency if we combine graphene oxide with bentonite, especially if you have higher contents of triglyceride as compared to free fatty acids. Other than this, we also try to uh, convert cellulose into glucose by using graphene oxide. The good thing with this graphene material is that it has a very high affinity with paper. Paper is a cellulose. You can write, all right? You use pencil in writing on the paper. And the pencil, that, I mean, the, this, the pencil is absorbed by the surface of the paper. That indicates high affinity of this carbon material with the paper. So we capitalize on that property the graphene oxide being adsorbed by cellulose on the surface, it will catalyze any reaction involving uh, cellulose. So we can easily convert cellulose into glucose also with the help of microwave irradiation. And the glucose, you can use this as a raw material for production of ethanol because this can be easily fermented as compared to cellulose. If you are interested, you may want to uh, refer to our papers published in Green Chemistry and Catalysis Science and Technology. We also work on the combination of carb carbon dioxide and water, and these are some of the applications. The good thing with carbon dioxide and water is that you produce a highly acidic environment, which is very good for reactions that will require high acidic conditions. Coca-Cola, Coke, this, that's pressurized. When you fill Coca-Cola bottle, it's, although it's plastic, it's quite hard because it's pressurized with carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide actually gives taste to the Coca-Cola. You form a carbonic acid. That's at around a pressure of two atmosphere. If you increase the pressure higher than two atmosphere, you will produce more carbonic acid and you can use that condition, carbonic acid in water, in order to catalyze reactions that will require acidic condition. And that's using carbon dioxide and water only. So it's like turning carbon dioxide from a liability into an asset by combining it with water. So how did we apply this to algal biomass? This is one example. Uh, algae, so we use the lipids or the oil present in algae in order to convert it into algal biodiesel. Of course, by reacting it with methanol. If you would like to uh, learn more about the details of the reaction happening using these catalysts, biofunctional catalysts, graphene oxide in combination with uh, silicon carbide um, modified by sodium hydroxide. You may want to refer to this publication, Energy Conversion and Management. So this is on the conversion of oil into biodiesel, algal biodiesel.
Fucoidan, this is a carbohydrate present in algae, like for example, seaweeds. Similar to cellulose, we can convert fucoidan, a carbohydrate, into sugars also, fucose. We call it fucose. And fucose, you can convert this into even more useful chemicals like propionate, propanol. This is an alcohol, propanol. So uh, fucoidan to fucose and then fucose into even more useful chemicals. Again, if you are interested in the mechanism taking place on the conversion of fucoidan to fucose using our technologies, you may want to refer to this publication, RSC Advances. What we are currently working with now is this hydrothermal. When we say hydrothermal, this is using water, but water at elevated temperature and pressure, close to about 250 degrees centigrade to 300 degrees centigrade. We are trying to convert microalgae, algae into bio oil, and then upgrading bio oil using a combination of carbon dioxide and water as well. Normally, bio oil can be upgraded into uh, like a, into a fuel which has a property suitable for gasoline engine by hydrogenation. But in our case, we don't use hydrogen. We just simply use the water because anyway, you can produce uh, H plus ions or hydrogen from water at elevated temperature, also in combination of carbon dioxide. So this is a very good uh, technique. So these are the green sustainable technologies that we are currently applying for the utilization of algal biomass into uh, useful chemicals and bioenergy. We develop technologies. Other than the technologies that we develop, we also need to develop human resources. And this is actually part of this uh, eAsia project, cultivating future Japan ASEAN STI leaders. And what are the activities that we are currently doing in relation to cultivating future Japan ASEAN STI leaders? One, exchange program with uh, partner universities in Thailand, Chulalongkorn University, King Mongkut University of Technology, the NASDA, and Silpakorn University. This happened in 2019 before coronavirus pandemic. Again, we are targeting this SDG number four, quality education, while cultivating future Japan ASEAN STI leaders we also target quality education. We also went to ITS. Thank you very much, Dr. Siti, for organizing this uh, exchange program with our students. Again, this happened in uh, 2020, uh, February of 2020. And then from ITS, we also went to UTP, um, University of Technology Petronas in Malaysia. So by these exchanges or student mobility, we can develop this kind of mindset, a global mindset among our students and students of our partner universities in Southeast Asia. We also offer this subject, Introduction to Science and Technology, Perspectives on Biomass Utilization. Before the, the pandemic, this is how, or this was how the classroom looked like. So we have a classroom 
with international students, Japanese students discussing on topics related to, to biomass utilization. Again, with this type of classroom, we would like to contribute towards the attainment of quality SDGs, number four, quality education. But because of the coronavirus situation, we cannot do this, all right, face to face. But still, uh, we continue with this perspective on biomass utilization. Um, we stick to uh, the plans of inviting uh, experts from all over the world, like uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, Australia, Spain, Thailand. And last year, we did it in collaboration with, again, ITS. Thank you very much, ITS, for this one. So we call this global team teaching. Global team teaching, we invite experts from around the world, team teaching with us on this topic on biomass utilization. And ITS also contributed, Professor Udisi Bhakti, uh, gave a lecture and also Dr. Sita Salaika also gave us a lecture. So this happened in collaboration with ITS and your students. And again, I thank, I thank ITS for making this happen. And uh, these are some of the uh, okay, photos of uh, perspectives on biomass utilization, global team teaching and COI. This happened last year. We also did it this year, but this time we expand, we expanded it to other partner universities in Southeast Asia. So those students from our partner university also participated in these perspectives on biomass utilization. This is our contribution for the attainment of quality education among Japan university and other universities in the region in Southeast Asia. Professor Maria, thank you so much for making this happen. Student mobility, Sakura Science Exchange Programs. This is another way of cultivating future Japan ASEAN STI leaders. This happened in 2019. Actually, this started 2014. We invite students from our part in universities to come to Kumamoto, Kumamoto University, and to look at the facilities and somehow they can join us for research in the future. So there are many cases that uh, join this Sakura Science Program. And after about one to two years, they come back to Kumamoto University to do research with us. These are some of the photos of the Sakura science that happened in 2019 of, or before the coronavirus pandemic. Again, because of the coronavirus situation, we cannot do this. We didn't give up. We did it online in collaboration with or with participants coming from, uh, again, various parts of the world concentrating on Southeast Asia, but we also have participants joining from Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, and even South Korea, Seoul National University. So uh, this is Sakura Science Exchange Program online. This is not only, uh, you know, like uh, scientific exchanges. Um, uh, what happened actually are also, uh, there are also some cultural exchanges that happened. And this is a very good venue. This kind of event is a very good venue to develop student with global uh, mindset. These are some of the, uh, all right, some of the activities that we have for a week, like, uh, 
introduction of uh, laboratory, the host laboratory, the KIDA laboratory, introduction of IROs and their activities, and uh, introduction of, again, the E-Asia project that we have. We also had the mini symposiums. We also have our global leader course students uh, presenting about uh, the local community and their ideas of uh, leadership. We also have uh, high school students participating in this uh, exchange program. High school students from the Philippine Science Guys from the Philippines. And uh, during the last day, Friday, we had this round table discussion on how these activities, the Sakura Science Exchange Program uh, can contribute to the utilization or contribute to uh, the realization of UN Sustainable Development Goals. We also did uh, on-demand exchanges using Facebook. This is uh, Facebook. We had this uh, Facebook group account where students can freely post their comments and also questions about uh, like uh, experiments and also about uh, the laboratories that they visited. Development of technologies multidisciplinarily, multinationally or cross-culturally. Development of human resources. These are some of the goals of this E-Asia GRP project in collaboration with partner universities from Southeast Asia and our university. And using these approaches, our goal is to contribute to a green sustainable earth by utilizing algal biomass. And we actually envision a robust algal biomass industry in the region that can also be a model for other parts of Southeast Asia and the world. Let me end this talk or lecture by these, I don't know if it is a cliche or what, I got from uh, Vancouver in Canada, City News. If the climate can change, so can we. And you can see here also how we can avoid a climate disaster. This is really imminent, all right? So we need to do something now and we need to do it fast. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Amando, for such um, awesome presentation. Um, I believe our participants also have a lot of uh, question in mind right now. But uh, please um, keep your question because we will listen to the um, uh, another lecture by Dr. Li Pengte. Um, just a second, I will uh, read out her uh, curriculum paper first. So if uh, one of the committee uh, could help me to share um, short uh, biography from uh, Dr. Li Pengte, that would be uh, really helpful. So uh, Dr. Li Pengte um, is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of uh, Chemical Science at uh, Faculty of Science and uh, Technology, um, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Um, her research interest uh, is around uh, advanced materials, heterogeneous solid acid based catalysis, renewable energy, and also CO2 capture and utilization, which is also uh, which is, uh, will be her presentation today. So, uh, really looking forward um, to the lecture delivered by Dr. Li Pengte. And again, if you have any question, you can always uh, submit your question in the chat box or using the uh, form um, uh, sent by the committee. 
and we will uh, read your question later during the question and answer session. So without further ado, I will hand this uh, session to uh, Dr. Uh, Li Pengte. You will have 40 minutes for uh, your lectures. And then after that, we will have a question and answer session in the end. Okay. So uh, Dr. Uh, Li Pengte, time is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ibu Fidatun, for your kind introductions. Thank you, ITS. Thank you, Prof. Maria. Uh, please allow me to share the slides. Okay, a very good afternoon and uh, selamat siang to all uh, participants. Uh, I am Teli Peng from Departments of Chemical Sciences, uh, University of Bangsa Malaysia. So it's my great pleasure today to be here to share some uh, about the mitigating climate change by CO2 capsules and utilizations. I'm very delighted to have the opportunity by Institute Technology Lono Pembles uh, to give uh, some sharing on this topic. First of all, I would like to outline the main points of my talk. Let's take a brief uh, look at the agenda. So I will begin uh, with some background of the CO2 emission and climate change. Then will be followed by the CO2 captures and utilizations. At the end of today's lecture, I will introduce you some of my current research. So I hope that at the end of today's uh, sharing, you will have some uh, clear image and idea about CO2 capture and utilizations. Um, let me begin with some self introductions. Uh, as mentioned earlier by Ibu Fidaton, I am uh, graduated from University Technology uh, Malaysia back in uh, 2016. Okay, so I actually is quite new in the field. Um, then I joined the uh, University of Bangsa Malaysia. Next, I would like to introduce uh, my university, University of Bangsa Malaysia. So, which located at uh, Bangi, Selangor, Malaysia. So, it's about 40 minutes from Kuala Lumpur, the capitals of Malaysia. So, this is our beautiful campus. UKM is, is one of the research university in Malaysia. So, with our motto, inspiring future, nurturing possibility. We have about 15 faculties and 12 institutes cover dis different disciplines and fields. We have science and technology, social science, economics, uh, health sciences, engineering, and etc. We do have the International Relations Center. We call it the UCAM Global for Strategic Collaborations and Global Network. Um, I would like to share with you some interesting facts about greenhouse effect. I think everyone has heard about and familiar with the term of greenhouse effect. So first, the sunlight passes through the atmosphere and it warms the earth. Then the infrared radiation is given off by the earth. These infrared uh, mostly will escape to the outer space, which allowing the earth to cool. But uh, some of them will be uh, trapped by gases in the air, including the carbon dioxide which keeping the earth warm and enough to sustain life. So if without this one, uh, usually uh, we will have an average temperature of about 18 degrees C. And this uh, actually, this we call it the natural greenhouse effect. And this occur naturally without any human emissions. But, um, uh, we are concerned about one, we call it the enhanced greenhouse effect. So this is effect is uh, referred to the increased heating of the Earth's surface 
uh, as a result of the higher amount of the greenhouse gases, for example, the carbon dioxide, they're being released into the atmosphere. Basically, it's due to the human activities. So this greenhouse effect uh, trap a lot of the outgoing radiation, which makes it less escape to the out, uh, outer space and our planet become hot. So when we have a lot of these trap uh, infrared by the greenhouse gases, the CO2, it will cause the global climate change. And it will cause uh, causes the melting uh, of polar ice, the rising in sea level, the floods, the high global temperature, and so on. These slides uh, show you the difference between the natural greenhouse effects. And on the right here is a human enhanced greenhouse effect. So this uh, climate change and global warming is happens is due to the excessive of carbon dioxide. In 2018, 80% of the gases were carbon dioxide followed by the methane, in which contribute about 10%. Then we have 7% of the nitrous oxide and 3% of the fluorinated gases. So based on the high volume of the CO2 emission, it can be concluded that CO2 is the major contributor to climate change and the global warming. On the right here, we have the tables. Uh, represent the characteristic of the greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are released uh, basically by the combustion of fossil fuel, deforestation, industry, fermentation, and other activities. However, these gases basically can remove through the photosynthesis, can remove through the photolysis. Um, and the re remaining greenhouse gases that absorb by the infrared radiation and indirectly influence in the ozone concentration. And when the amount of the, this gas is very high, then they will contribute to the global warming. Um, electricity, uh, transportation, and industrial processes. So they account for more than about uh, 80%. So um, it's very urgent needs uh, to develop te technology that can curb this emission. From the right here, we can see that the uh, transportation uh, sector in the Indonesia basically is emitted uh, the highest amount of the CO2 uh, for Asian country, followed by the uh, Thailands. Uh, followed by the Malaysia, Thailand, uh, then Philippines. Um, plus, a very low carbon mobility solution is needed to minimize these CO2 emissions. Um, this leads us to the next point, which is the Malaysia has made commitment to reduce the carbon emission, about 45% reduction as compared to 2005 level by 2030 and also the net zero carbons by 2050. Indonesia, one of the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitters, has put forward a plan to achieve net zero emission by 2060. Um, here is some example on the existing policy of the environmental sustainability. So many countries have adopted the implementations of the low carbon city, or we call it the LCC, to achieve the sustainable developments that can protect the earth from the effect of global warming and the climate change. For example, the Indonesia have the low carbon city planning project in Surabaya, Indonesia. Then we have a Japan, Japan action towards the creation of low carbon city. We have also Malaysia with the low carbon city framework. Um, this relates to what I was saying earlier. In low carbon city framework of Malaysia, there are several CO2 emission reduction strategy in various sectors, in the sector of energy, transport, waste, 
um, land use, land use change and forestry, and also the agricultures. Um, let me start with some general information on sustainable development goal. Um, in line with the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goal 2030, any new products, uh, any ma new material or product should not be only functional and cost effective, but also safe and sustainable to ensure compliance with the regulations and acceptance by the consumer. Climate change uh, is one of the goals in, in SDG, which aim to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. Among the key initiatives recently taken by the Malaysia government against the global warming and climate change issue is the low carbon economy. Um, the next topic I will be focused on is uh, about the CO2 captures and utilizations. So CO2 capture and utilization is one of the alternatives to mitigate the CO2 emissions. The current CO2 readings uh, we updated until October 2021 is about 414 ppm, which is uh, increased about 2 ppm as compared to the last year. And uh, I would like to draw your attention in which the current CO2 concentrations is above 400 ppm, which is, very, which is higher than the beginning of the pre-industrial. So it's about 278 ppm. So besides uh, converting, uh, besides capturing the CO2, it's very important we capture and, and utilize it so we can convert the CO2 into value-added products such as diameter ether, hydrocarbons, methane, hydrogens, formic acids, and methanol. Um, however, this uh, CO2 utilization and conversion process is very energy demanding task. And so therefore we need a catalyst or materials uh, in reducing this energy barrier. Um, now I would like to turn to explain the exiting CO2 capture processes. So uh, we have a three common uh, technique. So one is the post-combustion. Secondly is the pre-combustion. Tertially, we call it the OSIC combustion. So the post-combustion decarbonization is the technique based on the CO2 separation. So it's uh, occur after the Combustion. So we capture over here in which is occur after the combustion of fuels. So after the, uh, the combustion of fuels is have very uh, low CO2 partial pressure and also very low CO2 concentration. While in the pre-combustion, uh, the CO2 is uh, will be reduced from fuels before entering the combustion stage. So before we combat, uh, we doing the combustion, we will be doing the CO2 capture first. And this uh, achieved by the uh, uh, gasifications, okay? Before the CO2 captures, there is gasification process uh, to convert, uh, to obtain the product, the syn gas. Syn gas basically is the mixture consists of the carbon monoxide and also the hydrogens. Then this uh, carbon monoxide is transferred into CO2 by water gas shield reaction, WGS, then followed by the CO2 capture process. And uh, thirdly, we have oxy combustions. So this oxy combustion uh, is a relatively new uh, technology. And uh, involve, uh, this technology involves the combustion of fuels uh, in a nearly pure oxygen, so about, about 95 to 99 percent of the oxygen environment. That's why uh, it will be result is a very high fuel gas in a very high CO2 concentrations. Therefore, normally the capture of the CO2 is not needed in these oxy combustions, and it can be straightforward to the CO2 sequestration or utilization. However, this uh, oxy combustion process uh, is very costly because it uses a very uh, pure oxygen. Um, 
Let me elaborate further on the CO2 capture technology by this uh, comparison table. Okay, so uh, from the three techniques that I mentioned earlier, so I would like to highlight on the post combustions. So this uh, application basically it can be uh, uh, reprofited into the exiting process without any much modification of the exiting plant. So this uh, post combustion technique is the most uh, feasible approach. Um, the process mainly involve uh, chemical absorptions. Then we have the physical absorptions and also the membrane. So by comparing three uh, methods, uh, three process, the absorptions and also the chemical absorption and the physical absorption is the more uh, fo focus and gain more interest by the researchers. And uh, most of the membrane separation methods are still in the development stage. So the and the absorptions uh, is very promising uh, techniques uh, because it's capturing CO2 uh, and it has a very uh, low energy requirements. It has a very ease in handling and also lack of the corrosion problems. And in absorption techniques, uh, the development of the efficient absorbance is very crucial. Um, to, uh, to expand a little more on this, um, as demonstrated by these uh, tables, so we have the uh, commercially available okay, absorption techniques. Usually we call it the ab chemical absorption base. Based, uh, people usually will use the aqueous amine solution, such as 30% monoethanol amine MEA solutions. But this uh, absorption technique will inhibit uh, the advantages like low gas liquid contact area, low CO2 loading capacity, loss of solvent, high equipment corrosivity rate, high regeneration cost, and large absorber volume requirements. Therefore, absorptions appear to be a much better candidate uh, for CO2 captures due to its satisfactory properties and less captures Limitations such as it, it needs a very durable absorbance, it had high absorption capacity, um, it might we have economical solid absorbent, low regeneration energy requirements, easily handling and recovery, high uptake efficiency under humid conditions. Um, various CO2 capture technologies, along with the yeah, typical material queries under huge investigation. For example, we have uh, in the adoption, we have physical adoptions. Uh, people are using the geolites, activated carbon, morph materials. While uh, maybe in the chemical adoptions, we have uh, metal oxide, we have amine enriched, and we can have the modified morph. Um, I would like to emphasize here that the each absorbance uh, processes its own unique uh, characteristic and limitation during its application towards CO2 capture. For instance, we have the metal oxide-based absorbance have emerged as the excellent uh, absorbent due to the, uh, the occurs in abundance. Uh, and they have low cost and inhibit promising CO2 uptake. Um, uh, besides, we have also uh, silica. So silica is absorbent, have high surface area, uh, tunable porous structures, and it's very good thermal and mechanical strength. And so I would like to highlight that uh, high absorption efficiency is very related to the absorbent physical chemical properties. And, uh, and maybe we did some modification approach to modify the surface of the materials. And this is mainly controlled during the synthesis process of the absorbance. Um, here are some examples of the absorbance uh, to give you a better understanding. We have the amines supported on the porous materials. So amine can be supported on the jawline, morph, silica, graphene, clays, and also the polymer. 
we can have uh, using the Jolla absorbents, maybe, and doing different kinds of the modifications. Um, another good uh, uh, absorbent, CO2 absorbent, is uh, MOF materials. Okay, MOF material currently is very popular due to their high surface area, and we can easily twin the pore of the uh, absorbents. Then we can do uh, different kinds of modifications and functionalization of the MOF to enhance the CO2 absorption capacity. Um, we can have also carbon-based uh, CO2 absorbents, uh, like the graphene oxide, activated carbons, and so on. And different types of the modification can be done. For example, we can tune the texture properties of the carbons. We can do the chemical modification of the carbon surfaces. We can uh, hybrid the carbon-based material with other type of the materials. So uh, another one is uh, we can use uh, metal oxide. So for example, we have the magnesium oxide. It's one of the very good uh, CO2 absorbents. Uh, we can have the uh, calcium oxide. So um, the aforementioned the materials uh, is synthesized and it can be modified to be an efficient CO2 absorbance. So to summarize uh, absorbance for the selective uh, capture of the CO2, it must be meets uh, several spec specifications. For example, it might has uh, high absorptions and selectivities high thermal, chemical, and water stability, uh, fast kinetics, uh, you will have the uh, long-term of stability or recyclability of the materials. And of course, cost-effective is very important. It needs a very low cost and uh, low regeneration requirements and also heat of absorptions. Um, uh, Besides the CO2 capsules, it's very important if we can capture it, then we can convert it to other value added products. So I would like to turn in our attentions now to CO2 utilization. So a lot of the research is interest towards the CO2 utilizations, including we have the thermochemical conversion of CO2. We can have the photochemical conversion of CO2, electrochemical conversion of CO2, photoelectrochemical combustion of CO2, photothermal combustion of CO2, and also CO2 as soft oxygen for dehydrogenation. Basically, the CO2 molecule is thermodynamically stable and kinetically inert. So some reaction may still be non-spontaneous due to their high activation energy. Therefore, uh, for the CO2 conversion, we require a very suitable catalyst. So the catalyst can lower down the activation energy and allow or even accelerate the reaction at suitable temperature. So for today uh, sharing, I will focus on the thermal chemicals uh, conversions of CO2. So especially on the CO2 hydrogenation reaction to form methane, to form carbon monoxide, methanol, and several hydrocarbons. As I mentioned earlier, one of the value added product of CO2 conversion is methane. So methane is one of the most efficient means of energy storage. So as you can see in this figure, we can see methane have the uh, most efficient means of energy storage as compared to other kind of molecules. So and methane can also be easily liquefied and stored safely in large quantity. Um, two conventional methane synthesis methods, we have a uh, Sabatier's uh, Sandrans and fischer trop reaction. Both is a very viable option to produce methane. Um, this slide demonstrates on CO2 conversion to methane via the Sabatier's Sandrans reaction. So we have a carbon monoxide, a carbon dioxide react with the hydrogen to produce methane and also the water. Usually, it will be operates at the uh, moderate pressure and also moderate temperatures of about 200 to 500 degrees C. But the main difficulties in uh, operating this CO2 methanation is the management of the heat release caused by the strong exo 
permissivity of the reactions because it's very exothermic, negative 165. So by this, uh, we need to avoid the catalyst deactivations through the sintering or also uh, maybe the code depositions. Uh, due to that, uh, the choosing of the uh, very good uh, absorbance or very good material is very important. Uh, another uh, reaction, we call it the CO2 rye reforming of methane, uh, or we call it a DRM. So DRM is uh, using two types of the greenhouse gases, the methane and also the carbon dioxide. Uh, to produce this uh, syn gas, carbon monoxide, and also hydrogens. So this table show you the main reactions of the uh, DRM and also the side reactions of the DRM. For example, we have the reverse water gas shift reaction, the composition of methanes, the proportionation of carbon monoxide, hydrogenation of carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Um, so, DRM is a very uh, thermodynamically favorable reaction. Usually it's happen above 700 degrees C. So these are uh, very high temperatures. Um, it's promote the DRM uh, route. I mean, it promote these uh, main reactions and inhibits the side reaction. However, from the economics and also technical perspective, uh, it would be very good if we can lower down the uh, temperatures uh, below 700 degrees C. In order to do that, uh, very active stables and very selective catalysts uh, need to be introduced into this DRM system. Um, and uh, this uh, syn gas producing process uh, usually is very affiliated with the cooking process. So, for example, in this side reaction, we have can produce a lot of carbons. So these carbons uh, is will be affecting the uh, the whole uh, uh, catalytic activities for producing the syn gas. Therefore, we need to design and develop uh, very suitable and active materials in which it can enter and empty the sintering of the metals. And it's also a very cold, uh, resistant catalyst to increase the efficiency of DRM performance. Um, Besides the commercialization of this uh, DRM reaction on the industrial skill, it also depends on uh, very new and also stable and active catalyst. Um, we have also other types of the CO2 conversion process. We have the RWGS, reverse water gas shift reactions, in which these uh, reactions is generally considered to be a very suitable option because it produces the carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is very chemically active and it can be produced, uh, it is the intermediate to produce uh, the pentanol, the acetic acid, the dimethyl ethers, and others. We can have the CO2 hydrogenation to methanol. Okay, we're using the uh, CO2 react with the hydrogen, then we produce the methanol. So methanol is known as the uh, key products in the chemical industry. So it can be used as a solvent, it can be used as a fuel additive, or can be used as the fuel for the fuel cell. And it can be used as the building blocks to produce uh, other high values at the chemical, such as acetic acid, and uh, different types of the ester. Uh, we have also a very well-known uh, fissure trope reactions in which we will produce uh, hydrocarbons. Um, to conclude, uh, as it think catalyst, uh, it process several drawbacks such as it have a uh, low catalytic and uh, low catalytic activity and also product selectivities. Um, it have uh, accessibility and diffusion limitations. Um, it will be have uh, carbon depositions and met, met, uh, metal sintering. And it will be deactivated rapidly and also poor stability.
So, um, we have this scheme uh, uh, from our groups. Uh, we publish uh, papers on this uh, DRM and we propose that the uh, for the DRM catalyst, we have composed of two types. We have must have metals and have uh, support. Then uh, for the metals, usually it will be added as an active site for methane activation because for a DRM, we will react the CO2 with the methane. So it will be as a methane activation. Then this metal can be used as a promoter to enhance the properties. Usually people are using the nickel, cobalt, and also ruthenium. And for this uh, support, support if you prefer if you have a very good uh, oxygen storage, in which you can enhance the CO2 activation and inhibits the formation of the uh, undesirable carbon depositions. And we need to uh, twin the acidic properties of our support. Uh, usually, the medium strength of basicity is preferred. For example, uh, promoters such as molybdenum or lithium could enhance the properties of the uh, right reforming catalyst. And between the metal support interface, usually the surface reaction mechanism that occurs, then you produce uh, different kinds of the intermediates. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to recap the main point here. The CCU or these carbon uh, captures and utilization scenario is regarded as a prominent method for combating the carbon emission. So CO2 captures is the most uh, economical a feasible method to curb the carbon emission from the industrial point sources. Okay, so from here, then subsequent uh, utilizations and capturing the uh, CO2 and convert it to the value added products is very uh, needed. And overall, the CCU process is very vital importance uh, for addressing the global emission issue and also carbon intensive productions. Um, this slide shows some of the promising technologies and also future plans for the CCUS. So there are some uh, ongoing uh, projects in Japan, uh, Canada, and USA. Um, next, I will talk a little on my current research focus. Our current research focus uh, is on the mes uh, Mesoprojolite JSM5. Then, uh, and also Mesoprosilica, or uh, we have a MSN, and also SBA 15s. Then we have a fibrous uh, materials. Uh, we convert it uh, to the fibrous silica and also the fibrous jaw like ZSM5, in which uh, it have a fibrous morphology. Then we also interested on the uh, caustic materials and also about the uh, MOF, the Metal Organic Framework Materials. Um, we have studies uh, CO2 captures and CO2 conversion by using several types of material as listed over here. I would like to share with you some of our uh, recent publications. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you all to one of our recent publications on the applications of the fibrous silica materials with different uh, various uh, uh, metal oxide, for example, carbon uh, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, and also serum oxides for CO2 capture. So we can see here, this is the fibrous morphologies of our materials. This is the FISAM analysis. This is the TAM analysis. And we also tested for the uh, Recycle, okay, for five cycles to show the potential of these uh, materials. Um, we also study on the effect of the copper oxide loaded on the fibrous H2SM5 geolite for CO2 capture. So uh, from this study, it's demonstrated that the fibrous silica structures offer higher available space for CO2 absorption as compared to the commercial SO2. So we, this can uh, highlight the potential of the fibrous morphologies uh, and also a very important in terms of the high surface area and also porosity 
for enhancing the uh, CO2 physical absorptions. Um, so the physical solid absorbance uh, basically must inhibit the uh, excellent CO2 absorption desorption capacity, uh, good stability, and also high reusability. Uh, currently, we are focused on the metal oxide and also fibrous uh, material. So metal oxide can provide a very suitable uh, basicity and has a high CO2 affinity uh, and offering more absorption site. So uh, the metal oxide that we use, usually we are using the basic metal oxide because uh, CO2, we basically have a mild acid, so there will be have an affinity towards the acid and base. And we're interested on the fibrous material because it has a large surface area, abundance of porosity, stable framework, easily to tolerability, and we have a very unique morphology. So I believe that by combining both uh, metal oxide and also fibrous material, we can have uh, and could develop a very efficient and sustainable absorbent. Um, we have also studied about the uh, nickel fibrous SPF15 for uh, CO2 methanation. So this we compared uh, the nickel fibrous SPF15 to the nickel SPF15. So it shows uh, this is the mechanisms, the proper mechanism of this uh, CO2 uh, methanation process. And so we also uh, explore the uh, effect of different hydrothermal treatment techniques, such as the reflux, the Teflon, and the hydrothermal technique over nickel SBA15 so material for CO2 methanations. Um, we also uh, study a series of the uh, nickel Syria SBA15. Okay, using the uh, conventional impregnation methods, the ultrasonic imp assisted impregnation method and flat impregnation methods. So we compare the different techniques, uh, ni different uh, nickel and cerium loading techniques uh, towards the performance of the CO2 reformings of methane. Um, so I would like to draw your attention on our current published review papers on the uh, nano silica based uh, catalyst for syn gas production via the CO2 reformings of methane. So, nano silica supports are preferred due to their high thermal stability and porosity. So, in this review, we discuss on the uh, mesoporous nano silica, dendritic fibrous nano silica, and also the core shell nano silica. So from there, we conclude that the dendritic fibrous nano silica has high accessibility uh, and minor clogging. And while the core shell nano silica has low internal diffusion resistance and it processes the confinement e effect, while the because the, for, uh, the CO2 reforming of methane is very important in terms of the code management. So we need to manage in terms of the basic natural uh, and also the oxygen storage capacity of the support to uh, lower down the uh, code deposition process. Um, this uh, illustrations uh, would like to demonstrate the roles of each catalytic properties in nanosilica catalyst that can contribute to the enhance in the CO2 reforming of methane. Um, lastly, uh, about our recent progress uh, repapered in the Syria-based catalyst for the right reforming of methane. So Syria has a very high potential and it can be served as both catalyst support and also metal active site for absorption and dissociation of carbon dioxide and also methane. So it has a redox and also the acid-based properties in Syria that can be very good in terms of the carbon resistance and stability. So, and also uh, surface interaction and also surface modification is uh, affecting the reforming and the, the cooking pathway. And we can do the uh, regeneration of carbon deposits by using various gasification treatments. So, uh, we believe that the carbon dioxide capture and utilizations uh, can provide a very viable solutions to mitigating the climate change 
So, um, and I would like to highlight that the design and developments of the efficient material for carbon dioxide captures and utilization application is very, very important. Um, last but not least, our research focus on the design and synthesis of material, uh, characterization of materials and CO2 capture and CO2 conversions. Uh, that's bring me to the end of my presentations and sharing of today. I would like to acknowledge the uh, Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia uh, and University of Bangsa Malaysia for their financial funding, our local and international collaborators for their assistance and support, and my former and present undergraduate and postgraduate student for their hard work and commitment in carrying out all the research. And uh, that's all from me. I thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you very much for Dr. T. Lengpeng for our awesome presentation. So now we move on to the question and answer session. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to invite all participants. If you have any question, uh, you could type your question in the chat box directly or use uh, the link provided by the committee. Or if you want, you could also use the feature uh, from the Zoom. Yeah, you could raise your hand and you could uh, speak uh, directly to the speakers today. So feel free, uh, you could use um, any uh, method you want. But uh, before I read a question from the participant, so um, I would like to ask one question from uh, each speaker today. So first for um, Professor Armando. So my question is, uh, you mentioned regarding the, um, the use of the LJ for biomass. So uh, we, we understand, we, we have learned uh, in recent years that have been many research regarding uh, the use of alternative uh, resources for producing alternative energy. Um, in the case of algae, in the future, do you see a competition for algae to be used as biomass and algae for food? I would like to ask your opinion with this. Um, it's like this. Uh, although I presented here in my lecture today the possibilities of using algae as uh, raw material for production of useful chemicals and bioenergy, we can actually also uh, produce some uh, nutraceuticals, I should say, from uh, microalgae. So uh, there won't be, a, a, in the future, I, well, I couldn't see any uh, possible competition because we can also use microalgae or algae as foods, uh, health supplements, for, for example. And uh, what else? I, I, I mentioned about the conversion of, uh, for example, fucoidan into fucos. That's a carbohydrates. But we can also utilize uh, some uh, carotenoids that are present in seaweeds or algae in order to uh, also produce uh, some uh, health supplements or nutraceuticals. Uh, I, I hope I answered your question. Okay. Thank you, Professor Armando. So the next question, uh, before I read the question from the participant or uh, to let a participant to ask question, I have one question for uh, Dr. K. So my question uh, would be, uh, you mentioned regarding using metal oxide and also uh, fibrous material for CO2 captures. In your uh, recent uh, research, I would like to uh, connect that into um, the, uh, the first uh, graph that you presented earlier regarding the sector that contribute the most for the CO2 emission. Uh, from those graphs, from transportation, uh, from infrastructures, and also for, from other sectors, um, where do you think uh, this method for CO2 capture would be the best suitable in which in which sector would it be applied? 
will it be applicable in all sectors or uh, is it specific to I mean, maybe specific sector like infrastructure or transportation? All right. Um, so basically, uh, thank you for your questions. Um, basically, is for the uh, because the metal oxide and also the fibrous materials they are absorbent. So actually, we can implement uh, we can implement it into the light like, for the transportations, and also we can implement it in the for the industry. It is is a potential, but uh, for now actually they have a uh, few uh, like I listed there. There are few uh, technology they're already uh, using these uh, CCUS, mean carbon capture and utilizations, uh, to uh, implement in the industry. So they already tested, but uh, they need some time to be like uh, proven there is a useful uh, methods to reducing this uh, climate change and also reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. Okay. Thank you for your remark, Dr. Fei. So uh, we have received one question from the participant. So this question is uh, directed to, this is for uh, Dr. Fei. So uh, we have, so uh, the participant name is Muhammad Iman Maulana from Institute of Technology School November from ITS. So his question is, we have goals to change the energy sources from fossil to biomass. Yeah. But according to your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the biomass also produce uh, greenhouse gases, which is methane. So maybe the participant was uh, confused because methane is also among uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, okay. is the biomass uh, burning produce less Brian, uh, greenhouse gases, or is it otherwise? Uh, you mentioned regarding the, the methane uh, liquid, uh, liquid fraction earlier. You mean uh, the carbon dioxide methanation, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, basically the main contributor to the uh, greenhouse effect is the carbon dioxide. So the methane actually, they are only contributes a very less percent as compared to the uh, carbon dioxide. So the main uh, point here is good if we can do the CO2 reforming. That's why I'm focusing more on the CO2 reforming. And we use the both uh, greenhouse uh, gases, means the carbon dioxide and also the methane to produce a very uh, more significant thin gas, mean the hydrogen plus this carbon monoxide. Yeah, but yeah, people did, did this, uh, what we call as the CO2 methanation because Actually, the methane uh, now uh, actually is uh, commercially available. People are using in the vehicles and so on, but not uh, as well as the uh, hydrogen gas. Okay. But uh, I would like to highlight that that is possible. Just we would like to focus on the reducing the uh, larger contributor of the greenhouse gas in which the carbon dioxide as compared to the methane. Professor Armando, I see you, you raise your hand, please. Yeah, because this is a very interesting topic. For yes, me. correct. Uh, carbon dioxide, actually, by, uh, well, uh, methane reforming. You, of course, you produce methane, but you don't throw it away to the atmosphere. You use it as fuel, okay? Yes, you, yes, correct. You throw it away to the atmosphere that it will contribute to the greenhouse uh, gas effect, but you're converting CO2 to fuels anyway. So I think uh, there won't be any problem. Yeah, because you produce because, because, uh, methane. Uh, I mean, cows, of course, cows produce methane inside. That's mm. uh, well, that contributes to uh, the global warming also. All right. Okay. Yes. All right. Dr. D, you would like to add something? Uh, yeah, correct. I, I agree with uh, Prof. Amando. Thank you. Thank you for supporting. Right. Yeah, because the CO2 be converting to the methane, we not release it back to the env environments. We use it uh, in our vehicles, in our industries, and so on. Yeah, it's also the same as uh, when we use biogas. We also use um, from from the wastewater. We 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 use it as a resource, and then it can be useful. So yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question uh, from uh, Ima from our one of participant here. 
Okay, I would like to invite other participants. If you have question, you could use uh, the feature from the Zoom. So please, uh, you can raise your hand and you can uh, speak directly to our speakers today. Anyone? Okay, so we have a um, question from Maria. Ibu Maria. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pirda, for moderating this session. Thank you so much, Professor Armando, and also Dr. Teh Liping for the very interesting presentation. I just have, uh, because you are expert in your area, either in uh, carbon capturing and also for the biomass. Uh, actually, Indonesia is the one of the rich country with the biomass and also rich country with the uh, what what we call it lung of the earth we sometimes become a bit ignorance about the energy crisis however if we look at the commitment of our uh, president and of our country toward the reduction of co2 while actually now the priority of the government goes to the COVID recovery and health issue, for example. I just wonder if you have comment on the readiness of, uh, in this case, Malaysia and also Japan to uh, fulfill the commitment to reduce the CO2 by the target in 2030. Uh, because honestly, if I can say the Indonesian government and Indonesian technology not really as fast as uh, Japanese and Malaysian uh, progress, progression toward uh, the uh, reduction of CO2. I just wonder if you can comment on that. First, whether Japan and whether Malaysia can complete the target by 2030 in terms of uh, energy reduction by using the pace that you have right now. And then maybe as a academia, you also can suggest us how we can move faster because honestly, in terms of technology, we somehow left behind in uh, many situations. Thank you so much for your uh, suggestion, because as an academia, I'm also thinking how to accelerate, because we cannot just use webinar and workshop and lecture to accelerate the change. We need to have applied technology, real project, not only like this, but go straight to the community and do the job. But Unfortunately, in many situations, it is not easy to be minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, Prof, can I, please. Can I answer? Uh, yeah, Professor Maria, thank you so much for that uh, uh, comment or question. Japan, we don't have much biomass materials here in Japan or biomass feedstocks. So regarding biomass utilization, what we can contribute is to develop technologies. And that's what we are doing now. Regarding the realization of a carbon neutral society by 2050 or very soon 2030, I think Japan is towards the use of hydrogen as a fuel, hydrogen as a fuel. So we are, I think um, we're, well, Professor Mayer also uh, asked about the role of the academe, um, uh, especially those uh, research universities. They are now very active on the utilization of, uh, active in research for the utilization of hydrogen as uh, fuel. And we are also, in Japan, we are also uh, towards the increase in uh, hydrogen stations to replace these gasoline stations. Mm -hmm. And also uh, electric charging facilities and so on. So it's more on, on uh, electrification, mm -hmm. the use of electricity, the use of hydrogen, and uh, also the use of uh, hybrid cars in the future. That's what I see in order to uh, attain this uh, carbon neutral society by 2050. But Professor Maria, you are right. It's an ambitious goal, but we need to uh, 
like a uh, fast track in order to achieve this goal. And here in uh, Kumamoto University, we have a pledge, all right? We call it Kumamoto University Pledge for the attainment of SDGs. Mm -hmm. And that's how the academe or the academia can also contribute to this goal, I guess. All right. Professor Maria, I hope uh, I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. So you mentioned about Kumamoto University Pledge uh, uh, for the completion of SDGs. SDGs, uh, yes. Uh, this is uh, Professor Maria, let me add. Uh, this pledge actually is to connect to uh, the local community, not only local community, but also to uh, the industry in uh, local Kumamoto. We call this term open innovation. Open innovation uh, linking with local communities and linking with the local industries in order to achieve this uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, sorry if I ask a follow-up question once before maybe uh, Dr. Teh will answer. Professor uh, Armando, do you, do you know that whether Kumamoto University have a commitment as well to help other countries to uh, overcome the problem with CO2 or to achieve SDGs target, for example, like I mentioned before, Indonesia is a very big country with a lot of challenges. And in terms of uh, biomass utilization, in terms of uh, carbon capture, it is really challenging for us to, uh, you know, to, to comprehensively bring up all the islands in Indonesia toward the direction. So I just wonder if Kumamoto in, them, in, in this case has a kind of uh, commitment or specific program to support other developing countries in achieving SDGs. Do you think anything uh, yes, like that? Yes, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for that question. It's not Kumamoto University. I think it's uh, Japan committing to developing countries in order to achieve the sustainable development goals or a carbon neutral uh, society in the region. And when we talk about the Japanese government, we have some programs through Japan Science and Technology and also to the use of ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, it's a money. We have what we call SATREPS program. SATREPS program. Um, uh, half to be supported by JST, Japan Science and Technology half to be supported by ODA. It's like uh, per project, about 5 billion yen. I, I, 5 billion yen project, 2.5 from JST, 2.5 from ODA, in order to develop projects in developing countries to support this sustainable development goals. But that's, uh, I should say, uh, bilateral country to country agreement. Now, how, how could Kumamoto contribute to that? Well, we apply for that project and that's how we can support developing countries to attain these goals. Thank you, Professor Armando. Uh, Dr. T, you wanna All right. All right. Um, for our side, I think is uh, because we see lots of, uh, I mean, if we, we go out in the uh, street or anything, we can see the like electric car, right? Electric car, hybrids. We do have the biodiesels, although it's not much, but we do have, we have biodiesels. Then we have the Petronas who focus on the hydrogen's energies. So in uh, our uh, university itself, we have the uh, uh, cell fuel institute. So we would like like cell fuel hydrogen, uh, hydrogen cell fuel. So that, that one we can implement in the vehicles and so on. Then we do have like solar panels. Actually, we only uh, a lot focus on the solar panels that they install on the uh, half roofs and so on. So. Uh, I think in Malaysia, we basically go for the hydrogen energies and also the solar. 
because we not really on the biomass, we do have, but uh, we not really focus on that side. I think we do aware about the uh, climate change, uh, the CO2 and so on, but just in terms of the implementations, uh, somehow like actually it's not easy and uh, it takes a lot of time. So if let's say for the, uh, if, if we can achieve by 2030, um, we might, but maybe 2050 is better. Yeah. All right, thank you, Prof. Maria, for your questions. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, Dr. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so sure. Uh, I just wondered in Malaysia, in your university, because UKM is very advanced in research, so have uh, do you have any interdisciplinary research group that facilitates students to work together for carbon capture project or uh, hydrogen and so on and so forth? Yes, actually for if let's say we apply for the grant, internal grants or even the government grant, we will like a specific fields for the climate change. So we can implement the CO2 capturing under this, I mean, we can park under this team. So uh, yes, we do have that one. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ibu Maria for the question. So I would like to invite, is there any other participant who would like to ask question to our speakers today? Uh, you could uh, use the raise hand feature on the Zoom, yeah? And then you could uh, ask directly to our speakers. Yeah. Okay, um, no question uh, so far. So maybe I will, um, if there's no question I would like to ask. So because I also have uh, some question in mind. Um, it's actually a follow up a question from the question mentioned by Ibu, uh, Ibu Maria earlier. So uh, in Japan and Malaysia, is there any incentive given by the government? If for example, university, Nakumamoto University or University Kebangsaan Malaysia um, provide um, uh, individual um, alternative energy or not using the energy uh, provided by the country or using uh, renewable energy, yeah, does the university receive incentive or uh, let's say uh, the, the household do they receive incentive from the government if they install, let's say, solar panel in their household? So please, uh, Professor Armando. Prof. Yeah, in the, yes, in the case of Japan, yes, definitely. For the use of solar panel, they give mm -hmm. incentives. Also, so it's, for it's the considered use... as cheap for the household, so it's better to install a solar exactly. panel? Okay. Right. Yeah, that was before. I don't know if they are still uh, giving incentives now for the use of solar panels, but they also give incentives. You buy uh, hydrogen or what you call a fuel cell vehicles. If you buy one, you also get incentives from uh, the government. Right. Nice. Dr. Yes. Okay? yes, same goes to Malaysia. We have like uh, what we call that the cheaper bills on the solar panel. So actually it's now household, they are like encouraged to be like hybrid. So electricity plus the solar panels in our households. So they will be cheaper in terms of the building. Can I ask okay. one question uh, for Prof. Armando? Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. That's yeah. also fine for each speaker, each uh, ask question. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Yeah, uh, like, like Prof mentioned just now for the, uh, because uh, you're using the biomass, then uh, because you focus on the graphing outside, right? Why is it not uh, biomass, then you straight toward the activated carbons? I mean, like you focus on more on the graphenes. And the so the, the so graphene so. oxide is uh, even more active than those uh, activated carbon that we can get from biomass. But uh, there are also ways on how we can produce uh, graphene oxide from biomass anyway. So we are now focusing because we are in the academe, we're focusing on how to utilize those uh, active catalysts for our uh, reaction. That's why ah, we are focusing on graphene oxide. 
Correct. Because nowadays Rob. people are more, mm -hmm. I mean, people are doing more research on the reduced graphene oxide and graphene oxide. So I thought uh, like maybe, yeah. Well, um, uh, the graphene oxide, it's not so stable, especially mm -hmm. at high temperature of around 160 degrees centigrade, where you're going to use the functionalities on the surface. And losing those functionalities, you get the reduced uh, graphene oxide. But reduced graphene oxide is even still active and it's stable even at higher temperature. You can elevate the temperature a bit than the normal temperature, utilize the uh, reduced graphene oxide and you'll get almost the same um, uh, efficiency as that of the fresh graphene oxide. I see. Uh, regarding uh, carbon dioxide adsorption uh, capture, we also did a nitrogen mm -hmm. functionalization of reduced graphene oxide. And our technique is to use uh, uh, supercritical ammonia, actually. And All we right. get a very high, a very high impregnation of nitrogen on the surface of reduced graphene oxide, which I think you can consider for carbon dioxide capture. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Thank okay. you, thank you for your suggestions. Yeah, because uh, people are dealing with like amines, people look with amines sometimes, right? Yeah, but N is good because they will be more stable. And because it's uh, very good for adsorption of carbon yes, dioxide. Yes, correct. Yes, and because our approach using supercritical ammonia mm -hmm. actually uh, uh, gave the highest impregnation rates among all other approaches. All right. right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Professor Armando, and also Dr. T. Uh, if only we were in the same room right now, we will continue our discussion toward cafe break. Uh, another half an hour for another discussion. But unfortunately, we are reaching the end of the session today. It was a really um, great session with both of you. I really um, appreciate your time uh, for for, uh, for giving lecture uh, to the participant today. Uh, your presentation was really great. We learned a lot from uh, both of you, uh, Professor Armando and also Dr. T. Um, then uh, I would like to um, give this time back to the uh, our uh, MC today, Mbak Tias. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Mbak Tias. Now I'll give back to you. Okay, thank you, Ibu Gerda. And also thank you very much, Professor Armando Tikwiteng and Dr. Dahli Peng for the amazing and excellent lecture today. And as we have listened, we have had lecture about the Asia project on biomass, which highlights on algal biomass and the fact that ASEAN has the most abundant biomass and also how biomass conversion generated from the synergy of the hydrogen monoxide and also carbon dioxide. And we also have a mitigating climate change by CO2 capture and utilization, which highlights on CO2 as the major contributor of greenhouse gases and how metal oxides combined with fibrous material results in efficient and sustainable absorption as well. It is certainly uh, very enriching and expand our knowledge, especially for us to avoid uh, climate disasters. And I would like to thank Ibu Firda for conducting this amazing session today. Thank you, Ibu Firda. Please give thank a pause yes. to our speaker and moderator by using the Zoom reaction feature. And furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to our honorable speaker and also our moderator today. This is a certificate for Professor Armando. Thank you. And this is a certificate for Dr. Teh Peng. And this is a certificate for Ibu Ainul Firdatunisa, Master of Science.
And once again, we'd like to say thank you very much to Professor Armando and Dr. Tehlipeng. We believe that all lectures today will be beneficial for all participants. And thank you as well, Bufirda, for moderating on today's guest lecture series. And now, before we end our lecture series today, we would like to invite all participants, as well as the honorable speaker and moderator to take a group photo. So to all participants, we would like to ask you to open the camera. Okay, so as we have, as we have numerous slides, I will capture one by one. So please give your best smile. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, the next slide. One, two, three. All right, the third slide. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Now we finish the group photo. And for the next guest lecture series, we have uh, two streams, streams A and B. For the stream A, we have Dr. Sinamar S. Tudilo from Tarlac Agricultural University, who will deliver a topic about poultry and swine production and health management. And also Dr. Crystal Joy Isla from also Tarlac Agricultural University. We deliver combating branding, rabies, and with COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a one health approach. As for the stream B, we have one speaker, Ms. Sioni Cordova from Surigo State College of Technology, which deliver about animal science. So that's the end of our guest lecture series today. Um, don't forget to follow our social media on Instagram at ITS International Office and also our Facebook, ITS International Office, to keep updating our recent programs. And thank you for our honorable speaker and moderator once again. And all participants for our, your attention and participation. We are looking forward to see you again on the next GRS series. And good evening and keep safe and healthy. GRS on SDGs will be back next week. See you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you Thank to you. the students. You Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, Professor Armando. Dr. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Pufirda. Pak, sorry, uh, Prof. Armando and Dr. Tehli Peng. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.